So we'll jump on to the next lecture. We talked about basic properties of viruses this morning, the basic classification, as I said, uh, DNA and RNA viruses, and some of the properties which are there. Now, as I said, that the whole idea for these lectures is that uh, in your clinical life, you'll see quite a few cases like this, and then it will make you wonder uh, what's going on and how can we possibly address No, okay. Now you can see these are some of the clinical pictures that we normally see. All these, what are these? I mean, it's an impact. What do you call most of these uh, clinical warts? So these are basically called human warts. So this is a common viral infection that we normally see. And you can see from here, if they appear on the first side on the hands, very common, especially. Uh, and also keep in mind that they can come on many different types of tissues that we have, skin and mucous membrane, and uh, fingers, nipple, uh, upper part of the lip, lower part of the lip, like those kind of hanging little warts, and uh, shaft of penis, that's what, one, two, three, four, seventh one. And uh, for sexual transmissible diseases. A lot of work has been done in these viruses and people used to take them as over-the-counter drugs and very common and what's the big deal, that kind of an attitude. But uh, it so occurred that some of the scientists working on this field uh, came up with, with, with this hypothesis. That's why I said it's important for you to know. And I'm going to go run through some of the basic uh, themes of why do we care and what needs to be done. So I have used some of those Nobel Prize uh, presentations, especially on this particular aspect of clinical uh, disease. And you can see from here, again, nuclear material is within the cell. And you can see either an RNA and DNA. And some of these RNA, DNA will come th with the enzyme. And then there is an envelope. So I want you to pay attention to the envelope outside, protective envelope. Like you, in, in winter, you put layers of clothes to protect yourself. And those things which are jutting out, protruding out, these are like lipoproteins, glycoproteins, and something of that nature. And I know well you can appreciate a background picture. Do you see a background picture at the back? Or you do not? So there's a background picture over here showing in a male or a female. So that probably represents uh, this particular virus that I'm going to talk today as a sexually transmissible infection and sexually transmissible disease. And this, again, as I said earlier, is coming from two important aspects of viral infections that we normally come across. So you can see from here. On the left-hand side, basically, is a human papilloma virus. It has a circular, double-stranded DNA, and is protected by capsid protein, and the diameter for that is 50, 55 nanometer. If you compare that with HIV, which is a human immunodeficiency virus, is a retrovirus, and again, the larger lenti group, the viral RNA is converted to DNA, which basically integrates. You talk about reverse transcriptase. If you look at the size, 90 to 130 nanometer. And you can see the typical resemblance of these two bacteria uh, viruses. And again, the common theme for these viruses are they both are considered as infections, uh, sexual transmissible infection. And again, I remember when I taught it in 2008. So that was a big news uh, in 2008, very recently, by all standard, we had uh, Three important, a, one German, and then we have this French, two French scientists were given Nobel Prize in physiology and medicine for the work they did on this particular virus. Before that, people would not relate the incidents that such a benign little wart on the hands and the figures and the genitals or nipple and so on and so forth 
could be the cause of cancer. So these were the first people, they were given credit for associating, uh, they discovered and proved that uh, human papilloma virus is the cause of cervical cancer. So that was a big news. And again, uh, it took them a while. That's why we say some of the viruses called oncogenic viruses. So human papilloma virus is an oncogenic virus. And that's, again, one of the very common STIs, very common uh, cancers that we see in any part of the world. So you can see these people uh, had this idea for about 10 years, and they were searching for evidence to prove. So they had to do all those type of experiments where they can look at the cervical biopsies of infected cancer patient and then uh, wanted to probe that up and link it with the genetic of human papilloma virus. Again, some of the slide, as I said, I just borrowed from their uh, Nobel Prize presentation in 2008. I'm just going to run through that to give you a significance for that. So you can see from here, uh, from infection, a very benign infection in upper vault of vagina, and then you have the cervix involved over there, the virus lodges over there, and then the virus, because it's looking for the cells to invade, attach, it basically replicates there, and in the replication of virus, one of the properties of this virus is that it can be latent. So that's where virus disappears. So virus disappears in the mucosa of the cervix for months to come, and then keep on doing the damage. And you can see from here in the bottom slide over here, once the within weeks, the virus starts replicating and then months it establishes itself a place to live and then again human papilloma integrates into tumor cell DNA and that's again you will see uh, the cancer developing that's why we have to do pap smear uh, for most uh, there are different criteria uh, for uh, most of the women uh, once a year after 40 it depends upon the incidence and prevalence and you know family has taken genetic history the other important thing is that there's no one virus because viruses have this capability to mutate. There are many different types of serotypes. So those three scientists had a lot of work to do to find out that which particular type of the strain, especially you can see from here, there's a ton of strains over here for HPV-18 and HPV-16 were the culprits that basically led to a very high incidence of cancer. Okay. Now, again, another slide from their presentation. So you can see that uh, the structure of HPV, as I said earlier, human papilloma virus, circular, double-stranded DNA within itself, protected by a capsid protein, and there are more than 100 serotypes. But the problem is 70% of uh, all of the cancers that we normally see today are coming from HPV 16 and 18. And significance of that is because we need to protect uh, women from that particular strains by developing some immunization techniques, some vaccine there. Again, you will see the same uh, idea that you have a infection, then you have a latency, and then over time, even if the cell heals, 90% of healing may take within two, uh, uh, two years, but it can always come back because once you have an HPV infection, you have it for the rest of your life. So there are all, always chances that it's going to come back over and over again. That's why they look for carcinoma in situ. You can uh, look at the path sphere and want to see the earlier changes that may happen for women who have cervix, uh, cancer of the cervix. And again, you can see that we can look at the DNA. If you look at the incidences that we normally see, the worldwide incidences, then you can see that uh, we have like half a million cases every year. So we do see half a million cases of women having cervical cancers every year. And then you can see distribution worldwide. Some of the countries in South America, very high incident, Central Africa and Southern Africa, again, very high, India, Mongolia, and many other countries may have a very high incidence for this particular uh, virus that may cause uh, carcinoma of the cervix. The other spin to this virus is, and again, I'm not going to go and play all these things that I have, but I would want you to uh, see 
there was another news a um, couple of years ago, I, I believe it was Indonesia, that there's a person who developed so many warts on his face to begin with that they called him a tree man. So he had this HPV virus. It started off very benign, small, little, hanging, loose kind of virus in the beginning to such an extent that within some time, this particular patient developed virus like that. So the wart he had, you can see from here, just grew like a tree. And that was a scientific you know, enigma at that time. People didn't know what to do and people were scared to come closer to him. You can Google a tree, tree man and you'll see quite a few movies there. I don't know if, still, if he's still living or not. But uh, at that time, I think there was a professor in Stanford University. I may have some of his picture bold enough to go over there and take the sample and help it out that this was because of HPV. And then again, this is some of the other pictures. You can see his hands. This is how group. And uh, as a physician, I can tell you there's always something in your heart and mind that you are scared. You want to touch somebody. You want to be in somebody, especially for a, for a physician who know whether it's infective or not. Right? It's a really challenge. So it's tough. But I would uh, give due credit to that person that uh, from Stanford University, he went all the way over there and basically talk to him, and you can see him talking to that person. With, he, he knows that he has got all these different types of problems and so on and so forth. But there are some interesting uh, topics that you can uh, Google and find out. But this is the extent of a problem that we normally see in terms of people having HPV, okay? Now, coming back to the basics, this is a DNA virus. And uh, DNA viruses basically can be split up into two larger families. So we have larger families in this case, we call papilloma. The one what you saw is called papilloma viridi. And the other one is called polyoma uh, viridi. So there was a time that uh, we used to lump them together into uh, papo papova virus, but recently you want to split them up. This kind of splitting may take place as we get to know these viruses more and more in detail. Now, the most important thing that I'm going to tell you about these viruses is, and you also have to keep in mind, one of the uh, characteristics of these viruses is that they will cause tissue damage. They will go and expense, take your macromolecular synthesis to help them replicate. And eventually, they will either lyse the cell or bud out. So their capability of virus is called lytic capability. The other important thing for viruses is the chronicity. So they, once you get a virus, it's going to stay in your system. You may have a chronic inflammation. So things will come over and over again. The third important character for a general virus, especially for uh, this particular virus, is their capability of called latency. So they will hide themselves in your tissues. We just talked about carcinoma of cervix. This property is called latency, and they will hide and then wait for the time to show up. Now the question is, when do they come to haunt you again? The simple answer is when your immune system goes down and there are some other things happening, like, for example, if a person has a cancer or infectious disease or TB or immunodeficiency, anything that would... Uh, tire or anything that will uh, make your immune system work harder. So the immune system is taking care of that particular chronic problem and this virus will come back and uh, appear again. The other important thing is called transforming infections. So remember that it will appear in different forms. As I gave you the bunch of the six, seven different pictures all the way for a very benign little polyp on the upper part of the lip to areola of nipple, to uh, genitalia, to hands, and so on and so forth, but it can come in different forms and shapes. So it's called transforming, uh, depending upon. But generally, human papilloma virus is called warts. These are the warts, and then again, uh, we talked about the cervical cancer, and some of the other viruses. Uh, we'll talk that about that in detail, and. Uh, Bruton's virus, for example, some of these carcinogenic viruses are there. 
they may cause some infections that may appear asymptomatic but eventually will go and are associated with uh, renal disease or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So this is again some of the viruses that may have a other problem in terms of causing damage to different parts of your body. Uh, classically, we talked about papilloma viridi and then polyoma we call simian virus 40. Uh, again, there is a historical perspective for that discovered in monkeys in Africa and so on and so forth. But all you need to know is that there are two major groups of these particular DNA viruses, polyoma virus and papilloma virus. Now, uh, since they have a capsid, so they are resistant to inactivation. So you will very difficult to destroy them. So once they enter into your system, enter into the host, they will persist. So chronicity, latency, and persistem persistence is something that is there. The other important thing for these viruses is we call them asymptomatic shedding. So the person who has this virus is shedding that virus without knowing it. I mean, again, you can imagine a public health scenario. People are using, I mean, the commonest example I can give you like swimming pools or, I mean, that's the, I think, commonest example where people will use that facility by, and share it with the rest of the people. So if they are shedding viruses, these viruses can be picked up by other people and their immune system can be challenged and they, they may get it. For uh, HPV, again, uh, we discussed earlier as well, circular DNA. And again, uh, most of the time, they go for skin and mucous membrane. So we call them uh, squamous epithelial cells. That's what they have liking for. So you see most of things happening, especially for the skin in terms of what or uh, cervical cancer, which is a mucous membrane. So if it appears on the skin, we call it wart. If it ap appears on the mucous membrane, like oral cavity or uh, upper part of vagina or the tip of the cervix, a, a particular papilloma, a polyp hanging loose, we call it papilloma. So these are the two terms that we normally use. We need to know how is it transmitted because that's an important uh, aspect. And again, uh, since we already discussed that, it's in one of the STIs as well. So it's spread by sexual contact. You can also get it by direct contact. And for a direct contact, touch the patient or uh, share some of the fomites. Fomites include clothing, bedding, linen, utensils, or other things. And then vertical transmission may mean that if the mother is infected, she has a beginning of cervical cancer or she has infection of the upper part of vagina, upper vault of vagina. And then again, she uh, gives birth vaginally to the baby. So that infected birth canal can lead to the babies having laryngeal papillomas. And I, I think if you went to that workshop, you saw some of the pictures, uh, some, some kind of nasty pictures of those babies suffering from human papilloma virus, and I may have it for this slide, I don't remember. So uh, the other important thing for transmission is that uh, when we teach you human papilloma virus, that makes you think that, well, it may be for those people who are involved in that kind of promiscuous, promiscuous activity, and they more have, have more than one sexual partner, and so on and so forth, but the fact is, uh, this is the uh, most prevalent ST infection in the world. As I said, the incidence is 100%. It's just like all you need to have uh, this particular infection is uh, one sexual activity, and that's enough to give you uh, this particular HPV virus. And then again, we talked about the low risk types and high risk type, and I talked about two important uh, serotypes for that because we want to develop vaccines against them, okay? The other important thing, uh, especially for polyoma, and I just an example for the public swimming pools or bodies of water where people will jump into and share that, again, uh, 
that's also an important source of contaminated water. And then again, inhalation, again, if you happen to share that particular room or particular, in our case, nosocomial infection, because you happen to be there in those wards where people are suffering from that. Now, just an explanation of fomites. That's the normally term that we use, the, especially in the hospital settings, furniture, bathroom floors, towels, and so on. That also makes you think, uh, I don't know if there was any search, research done or not, because especially most of my friends who are physicians, they are, I would say, uh, I wouldn't say uh, fastidious, but even anything that's more than fastidious, that if even if they were to go in a five star five star hotel and they will resist to even use towels over there, because uh, these towels are not autoclaved. Of course, they cannot afford to autoclave them. But uh, since anything that is being repeatedly used over and over again, uh, there always are chances that uh, you may have that problem, and you can pick up these viruses from the people who've been using it. So. Unfortunately, that's the case. They are present worldwide. There's no season, uh, seasonal incidents. As far as uh, modes of control, your book says no modes of control, but I think we are working on it. So one of the things that you want to do in modes of control is like allergy. And say, I've got allergy to such and such thing. So what will be the number one mode of control for, for management? Avoid the allergen. Simple as that. Okay, so that's what I said pe to people last time in the class that if you know the 100% of you are going to get it, uh, HPV, so what do you want to avoid then? Say? Any sexual, Any sexual contact. That's what it is. Okay. Now you can see, as far as pathogenesis is concerned, it's direct contact with the small breaks in skin, uh, sexual intercourse, we talk about vertical transmission. And then finally, contaminated surfaces, again, is beyond your control. Uh, I don't want to make you paranoid, but sometimes you happen to become a paranoid, and then uh, you will see different type of behavior, especially for infectious disease consultants. Many of them will always wear gloves. Some of them will wash their hands, and so on and so forth. But I think it's fair enough for health-related people to appreciate at least they can protect themselves. How can I protect myself from getting HPV? As simple as that. Unfortunately, the statistics we have, as we just said, the uh, absolute protection will be uh, having no sexual contact as, at all. But even in monogamous relationship, there is a higher incidence of people, both of the partners, having an HPV infection. So then the second line of control will be to go for vaccination. So this is something that we do not think of those lines. If prevalence is so high, incidence is so high, what do we need to do? So that's, I think, something I want, to, want you to take from that. Uh, <clears throat> in any kind of sexual activity, it is there. And uh, as I said earlier, it's so common, there's, there's nothing you can do about that. And I would argue, and again, is something to open to debate as well. There was a time a couple of years ago when they came up with the vaccine Gardasil. They wanted to make sure that it should be given to teenage girls uh, who are sexually active. Then the problem was, how would you know that? And there are CDG statistics. They are going to find out. I remember in early 90s when we were taught, we were taught about HPV, and they wanted to use this particular vaccine, and they wanted to collect the incidence for the high school. For example, they wanted to find the incidence of uh, high school students uh, having sexual contact. So the CDC maintains in 1991, 90%. It was 90% for both boys and girls. And then they, when they did statistics on finding out how many partners do they have in a year for high school kids, the average was four. So they changed four sexual partners in a year in 1991 and high school kids. So you can imagine when government has to come up with these kind of vaccine introduction, they mandated that for girls at that time. But right now, 
as it stands, it is for both, for boys and girls. So things kind of are like plastic in terms of what do we do and how do we do. But at least you can appreciate the problem, okay? And I'm not going to spend much time on that. And uh, we already discussed who is at risk and what can we do. The other important thing, especially for this particular viruses, I use the term oncogenic viruses. So these are the viruses that are prone to cause cancer. Okay. Now these are not the only viruses within this family that cause uh, oncogenesis. We have some other viruses as well that uh, may be present, but they basically uh, have less prevalence. So they have less prevalence in terms of causing a particular disease. And uh, as I said earlier, also depends upon uh, where you're practicing. The global incidents I just told you, uh, South America, India, uh, I thought that was probably Nepal, if I remember geographically correct and some of the other parts. And the reason being, they think, is because of the use of uh, that vaccine. And then, it, by all means, the vaccine is not, by all means, cheap. It's very expensive. Vaccines are usually expensive. I would say one vaccine shot will cost like $250 if it's not covered by insurance. Okay. Now, uh, if you understand the whole sequence of progression of a particular disease, of some of the viruses that we have, especially if they go and inoculate your respiratory system. So they are going to divide into respiratory system. And you remember that uh, one of the qualities of respiratory system is, what is the biggest quality of the respiratory system in terms of uh, being a portal of entry? What do you think could be the biggest problem of us acquiring virus from our respiratory system? That has the richest blood supply. The chances are, that's why you want to absorb oxygen. It rightly goes into the blood. And there is a very thin uh, membrane, respiratory membrane. So the chances are that you acquire this virus, it's going to go and multiply into your respiratory tract, and you will have something called primary viremia. So virus will come in blood. And when you know, based upon your physiology, viruses, when they come in the blood, Blood then goes to be filtered in spleen, liver, and kidneys. So these are the three organs. If you have primary viremia, viruses running in your system, they will lodge themselves into these different areas. And you may see a peripheral uh, disease as well. Okay? Now, if you have a good immune system, your immune system should take care of it. And then again, it will disappear temporarily. But I just told you that viruses will hide as well. They will hide in a place, evade your immune system, and never to be seen back. Unfortunately, later part of your life, or any part of your life, especially in old age, uh, if you're immunosuppressed, so aging also causes immunosuppression because you don't have that kind of a good mounting response. So that's why. Uh, we always see some of the diseases which become latent in the later part of your life. So we call that process called reactivation. So the same disease that you acquired 30 years ago when you were young, it can basically reacquire and that's where the problems come. When your immune system is very weak, the same virus that was good enough to cause damage to your respiratory system now may go and cause problem in and lodge in your brain. So you have encephalopathies and so on and so forth. Okay, now um, we talked about the incidence of cervical cancer. Again, uh, you can see from here, and just want you to uh, give, give this an idea that when public health people want to mandate a vaccine or mandate a pap smear or mandate a particular policy, it's based upon CDC statistics. So if you look at this one, you will see that uh, Less than two out of every 100,000 women ages 20 to 24 will get cervical cancer each year. But as we move along, I just told you it's mandatory for you to have, I mean, shouldn't say mandatory, required, recommended for you to have a pap smear every year if you're over 40. So you can see that is basically coming from the incidence of cervical cancer, which is pretty high 
especially uh, for women. But some of the uh, states and some of the uh, boards will take a protective approach. They would say, okay, why should we wait till 40? If they are already sexually active, they can acquire it and everybody's different, so let's begin with 30. So it depends upon incidences and so on and so forth. Okay. The other important thing is that, of course, uh, these are some of the hypothetical and philosophical reasons that I don't want to discuss in the class, but uh, those of you who are interested, we can have a discussion, especially for the research students that I have. Uh, of course, if you have a family history, if you have genetic predisposition, there are always chances. There's always, also remember, you may have genetic predisposition, but you may not have disease rest of your life. I don't want to give you an example for the Hollywood celebrities that will go for extreme kind of an action where you know that your mother had breast cancer, you have your breast removed, you know your mother had ovarian cancer, you have your ovaries removed, you know your grandmother had your uterus, so I don't know how many organs you want to get removed from your body. But eventually, if you argue, it depends. It depends upon uh, how you take that particular incidence. But generally, approach is for most of the women who are above 40, and they have had their families completed, and they don't want to get pregnant and babies, so they would rather remove the uterus than to put them to a risk of having a uterine cancer. So that can be uh, talked to the patient, and that could be ethically correct. But some other things, again, you can see from here, uh, is open to discussion. But uh, I'm pretty sure you cannot appreciate that. But there was a time when we used to uh, argue about that, who should get vaccine, especially for uh, the HPV. So we had two vaccines available. And you can see uh, Cervarix and Guardia cell. And then you start wondering, why CDC recommends that, because I just told you that it is acquired sexually, and why would CDC recommend 11, 11, and, 11, and, 12, 11 and 12 years? And then in one of my other slides, I'll show it to you the statistics that basically are coming. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that uh, if you already have a predisposition, for example, you already have an HPV infection, it's just like, let me put it this way, you want to go for a vaccine before you acquire that particular virus, right? So the CDC will say, okay, let's start uh, giving vaccine to 12-year-old. And then the data will come that 11-year-old are already sexually active. So they want to go and decrease the age because the vaccine will only work if you get this vaccine prior to you getting that particular virus. Does that make sense? Because neither vaccine treats existing HPV. If you already have an HPV, and I just told you all you need to have is only one sexual activity that's good enough for you to get HPV, and then again, no matter what you do after that, it's immaterial. All right? So that's how the decrease in age comes from based upon the CDD. But if you look at the state policies, so you can see different states have different policies. And uh, also keep in mind, we talk about the cost of immunity. CVS and uh, Walgreens are going to make money. And those of you who work, they tell me that you get a bonus if you sell a vaccine. Is that correct? This being, there always are chances. But you can see if you look at the cost that comes like diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, 108. If you look at HPV, $359. So you have to explain to parents who have teenage daughters that we want to give your vac a teenage daughter a vaccine when she is 11 because she may be involved in sexual activity. So you can imagine the challenge that you will have to explain to the parents and how would that conversation go. And by the end of the day, they have to... Uh, have $360, so it's, that's, that's tough, all right? So you can see different states have different policies. 19 states have a uh, mandate compulsory, 
and the other states are still half and half going through that situation. As far as PAP test is concerned, again, uh, as I said earlier, different factors and uh, the consensus of opinion is that uh, it should be done. I mean, because the dangers between you getting HPV and getting a cervical cancer is, is very high. But at the same time, uh, I will leave it on you and want to force my opinion on you, but you can make your own good choices to determine why and how. The only thing my job over here is to give you the scientific uh, thinking and reasoning. And I'm, I, I, I think you can even ask me a question or uh, come to me and discuss with me, but I think so far I've said that this particular HP vaccine, HPV vaccine is to be given before you get an HPV, otherwise there's no use. And the second thing, we talked about the age. The third thing, we talked about the sex. The fourth thing, I talked about the cost involved. So there are many factors over there, and I've written quite a few things for you to look at and determine in terms of policies, in terms of state policies, in terms of universal policies. But one thing you will all agree, that uh, the incidence of cervical cancer is very high uh, in uh, women, so pap smear is invasive, I will take that, but again it's a very benign test in terms of picking out a cancer in the beginning, we call carcinoma in situ. What it does is it just scrapes the, wall, the cervix head a little bit and see if the cells have started showing the earlier changes like metaplasia and then they go from there. Uh, you can see the estimated HPV prevalence in the world and uh, you will see very high, uh, especially in Canada and USA. For some reason, the highest prevalence of HPV, I don't know whether you can appreciate from ambiguity that's over there, but you can read it on your own, on your PowerPoint. Uh, Spain, some, I think uh, Spain, Spain is one of the country, Italy, uh, Burma, Thailand, Far East, have very, very higher incidences as compared to the rest of the world. By all standards, you can see that uh, US and all countries of the world have pretty much, pretty much very significant uh, number of uh, incidences. If you look at the race and ethnicity, and again, as I said, that uh, for this particular uh, epidemiological thing, you can see that uh, non-Hispanic blacks have a very high incident as compared to others in terms of papilloma acquiring and again it ties up with their sexual activity pattern. You can go and uh, the other thing as I was when I was teaching you STD and uh, I told you that uh, there was a time we used to consider human genitals as the primary sex organs but since the sexual preferences of people have been changing so we may get those cancers that we used to get are like vaginal or penile cancer. Now we are getting anal cancer, oral cancer, laryngeal cancer, and so on and so forth. And you can see it's pretty much high uh, in quite a bunch of people in terms of the sexual preferences they want, uh, they want to have. So HIV positive cancers are spreading, especially in the middle, uh, middle age group. And then again, it ties up with the uh, sexual preferences they have. If you were to compare that in terms of associated cancer that we get, so you can see the cervical cancer has a higher incidence in women, very high incidence as compared to vulvar or vaginal cancer. Uh, and then again, if you look at uh, men, again, they have a penile cancer, anal cancer, again, because uh, the... Uh, the population of group that we discussed in a uh, workshop also, you will see that uh, head and neck means oral. So basically oral papilloma and papillomatosis, that's what we normally see. CDC does maintain a record, and um, I, I don't intend to give you much of the, uh, the detail. But all I'm trying to say right now is that nearly all cervical cancers are called by HPV. Some of the cancers of you can see from here different parts of the body that are used for sexual contact 
may have a higher incidence of HPV-associated cancers. CDC keeps a record for uh, cervical cancer, vulvar cancer, vaginal, penile, anal, oral cavity, and so on and so forth. And you will see some of the states have a very, very invasive, we call invasive cancers, which are out there. Some of the facts I just copied and pasted from a CDC website, but also keep in mind that uh, all CDC is trying to do is to educate people. And I have no desired intention to teach you cervical cancer in this class, other than give you this idea that it is basically a tip of iceberg. That's what you see in the right lower hand corner. Everybody's exposed. So you have a very higher percentage of people getting exposed. Uh, people normally see those genital warts, very small percentage. They have to look at colposcopy. Colposcopy is when you look at the vaginal speculum and look at the cervix. If you were to look at that, like an earlier stage on the right hand side, you will see nothing visually, you may see a little bit of roughening of skin over there and then gradually as the cancer moves on, so you can see uh, earlier and later stages of causing damage to cervic cervix. And then again, uh, if you compare that in terms of number, especially for US, by all standards, 148 million is a very high number. If the population is like 300 million, and if you take uh, separate men versus women, so this is a very, very high percentage of women having HPV. And these, as I said earlier, these are uh, the women who are there in monogamous relationship and may have only one sex partner in the entire life. If you were to look clinically, I hope you don't get a chance to look at it, but if you were to look at it, so you can see normal on the left-hand side, the normal cervix as compared to the invasive we call CIN means carcinoma in situ so this like the neoplasia beginning so you will see firstly the problems beginning and then you have a high grade uh, carcinoma and then you have a full blown cancer and then again by the time you see a cancer like cervix of that kind of a magnitude and you can see on the top over there cervical cancer that's too too little too late for us to do anything and I, I don't expect that to happen, uh, especially in this part of the world where people are cautious and people have an ability to seek medical attention. But if you do go in different parts of the world, you may see that. If you look at the uh, vaccine, so now the whole idea is vaccine. Uh, as I said earlier, the vaccine basically is there to teach your immune system to be prepared for subsequent entry of this HPV. And you can see from there, it's basically neutralizing antibodies. So it's a neutralizing antibody over there, as I discussed in the morning lecture as well. You don't want the virus to invade into your system. That's the whole idea. So you want to stop it there. And uh, you can see from here, uh, we looked at this PAP screening, and you look at the changes that happen over time, and new. It's very easy for you. I just told you that the virus needs to enter your cell and use your macromolecular synthesis to reproduce, to replicate. So in the process of doing it, it's inserting its own RNA and DNA into your cellular <coughs> genetics. So while it's doing it, it's manipulating the whole system. That's why your cells would not be normal. And then you have many different types of cells being produced. So that's the whole idea over there, especially for the type of epithelium that you have. Now by all standards, upper part of vagina and the head of the cervix does carry a multi-layer kind of epithelium that you can see that we have a, a columnar epithelium, we have a basement membrane. By all standards, it's pretty tough. But the viruses also are have this capability to go and invade and cause problem and bring those uh, changes that we normally see. So those of you who are interested, uh, I just copied it from, uh, again, you can see from uh, the Nature uh, Review. Uh, for those of you who are interested, in especially for genetics of uh, 
urogenital tract and the drugs that we normally use, you'll find it quite helpful. And uh, this is basically uh, a legend for that one. And lastly, in the same group for uh, uh, the viruses that we've been talking about is an adenovirus. Basically, it's a simple virus because it is... Uh, does anybody remember if I was talking about two important uh, aspects for the glycoproteins on the viruses? I said heme agglutinin, H, and neuroaminidase. That's where the H1N1 is coming from. And they say H1N1 virus flu. That's, you must have heard that, right? So that basically is coming from this particular structure that you are there. You can see over here heme, heme agglutinin pattern. So the idea is that viruses have this capability to agglutinate the cells. So they will latch onto different red cells and kind of, you know, agglutinate them and then cause problems. There are different type of... Uh, uh, viruses that cause, but we lump them together into ade adenoviridae. And these are the common things that you normally see, respiratory tract infection, pharyngoconjunctivitis, hemorrhagic cystitis, and gastroenteritis, very common adenovirus. And uh, again, I would uh, suggest to you, recommend to you, uh, that for viruses, you can also make a table in terms of uh, DNA, RNA, structure of DNA, RNA, envelope versus non-envelope. The whole idea is as you can see from the next slide, if this is a non-enveloped one, it's not destroyed in the environment. It remains stable. And it is easily transmitted. So that's why if you catch a cold, you're going to pass it on to the people. That's why if you call the, uh, those of you who have kids to school, you know, if you call the attendance lines, if you say, if you think your child has a flu-like symptom, keep your child home. So your kids will tell you whether they, when they haven't done their homework what you need to tell those people. So this is there uh, that we, is easily transmitted. You don't want to have whole school suffering from that. So even the mildest, mildest of thing of, they say if you think it's a flu-like syndrome, keep your child home. So it's so protective. So these are uh, typical uh, adenoviruses. And as I said that, uh, you can make your own uh, group. I don't usually ask much in that, other than the properties that are, I'm going to repeat over and over again, that they are lytic, they are persistent. And one important thing is that, uh, for example, those of you who are going to come and work with me, with me, for example, for research, we have a cancer cell lines. We call it cancer cell lines. So this means the cell lines that we use are cancerous. What it means is, is immortalized. They will live forever. How do we do that? We take this human cell, infect them with viruses. So that gives this capability of those cells to be immortalized. So you can imagine the problem with viruses. You know, they no, never go away. They never disappear. That's why we call immortalized certain animal cells that we normally do. Okay. As far as pathogenesis immunity is concerned, again, uh, uh, lytic. This means they will go for your mucoepithelial cells of the mouth, lyse them. A, I told you that they always remain in your system latent. Where do they live? They live in your adenites, lymphoid. They can transform and cause damage. Depending, depending upon what is the target of, I mean, it's as simple as that. If they go in the brain, men, encephalocephalitis, meningitis. If they go to respiratory tract, asthma. If they go into your stomach, diarrhea. So they have all different kinds of mechanisms that they go and cause. For most viruses that go into the blood, like for example have primary viremia, then what you need to do is you have to look if they are causing something we call cytomegaly. This means that they are causing enlargement of your organs. For example, hepatitis. They will cause enlargement of your heart organs. Splenomegaly. Your spleen can... So if you have a Viral infection, physicians normally would go and palpate your liver if it's enlarged. They're going to palpate your spleen if it's enlarged. They want to find out if your lymph nodes are enlarged. That's important for them to know because that will give you an idea at what kind of spread of these particular viruses have. And this is pretty much the same for most of the viruses that you normally see. Now, in these adenoviruses, since they enter in your mouth, so we have two defense organisms, adenites and pharyngeal tonsils over there. So they will catch upon these viruses and they get inflamed. 
right? So once they get inflamed because these viruses has liking for mucoepithelial cell, then they will persist. So you may have a viral pharyngitis. Most of the time they don't do anything. But the viral pharyngitis depends if they are not going to uh, cause enlargement of those lymph nodes to such an extent the respiratory tract is blocked, especially in the babies. So if adenoids are closing your airway, they will cut them off. Or tonsils are blocking your airways, they will cut you off. As far as spread is concerned, I think uh, you'll, make, you'll feel that I'm going to repeat it over and over again. What you need to know is, regardless of whatever the port of entry is, eye, ear, nose, any opening on your system, on your body, is linked with lymphoid system. Lymphoid system will pick it up. Lymphoid system is going to deliver it to uh, blood. So you have viruses running in your skin. You have viruses running in your lymphatic system. And then again, your immune system will divide decide whether it's going to contain it or not contain it. And so these are some of the important things. And uh, as I said earlier as well, if the virus is lodge in gastrointestinal tract, they will cause gastrointestinal tract symptoms. If they are lodge in respiratory tract, they will cause respiratory system. You just give me a minute, and I'll be done in a minute. Transmission, again, pretty much the same for most of the viruses. All you need to know is, and I'll emphasize again, if they, have, if they are naked or they have an envelope. So they basically will give you the basic idea what is it and how is it they're going to be transmitted. And the last slide is that, again, I'm pretty sure you want to know who is at risk of adenoviruses. Usually they are younger, uh, younger people because of their immunity not being developed, older people, uh, people uh, living in crowded areas. I gave you an example for viruses being asymptomatically shed if you were to uh, use public communal baths, if you want to do public wash, what do you call, swimming pools, if you happen to be school, there is crowding, there always are incidences. And then again, uh, uh, for adenoviruses, for common cold and other things, we don't give any vaccine, but these vaccines are available. And again, I would advise you to, uh, to keep yourself to the basics. And uh, for clinical summaries, pretty much the same thing. Uh, apart from the hepatitis virus that I will discuss in detail, I don't intend to tell you what's gastroenteritis. And then uh, finally, depending upon whether they are naked or they have envelope, this is how you treat and prevent and control. So pretty much the same thing that is out there. And uh, lastly, there is something that I will discuss in detail, which is called gene replacement therapy. So there are some of the slides in the end, and I'll give you my take on that, especially for a research part. And that's about all for today's lecture, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.